So thank you so much for everybody for joining today. It is so wonderful to see you. Uh, and I can't tell you how excited I am to have such an exceptional group of sales leaders representing Canada today. Uh, so thank you for taking 90 minutes of your time at such a busy time of the year to share your insights uh, with our Global Sales Science Institute. As you know, I'm a professor at Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University, and I've co-founded one of the first sales leadership programs in our country. And I'd say one of the, the top ones. I'm very proud of the work we're doing at Ted Rogers School of Management on advancing sales education for our young people and the next generation of sales talent in Canada. So thank you for being part of this. I'm also the co-chair of the Global Sales Science Institute virtual conference this year. And this, this GSSI group I really like because it's a group of global practitioners and academics who get together to advance sales research and sales education and, and, and do it in a collaborative manner. And so this is one of 20 videos that are going to be 20 country sales leader videos that are going to be shared amongst the community. And I believe we'll develop some great insights and ideas out of this. So thank you again for joining this morning. Um, so, so to get started, I would like you to please give a 30 second introduction about yourself. And if you could just talk a little bit about your, the name of your company, your role, and, and tell us a little bit about your sales team uh, as we get started, please. And why don't we get started with Suzanne? Oh, great. Thank you, Karen. And I love the work that's going on at Ryerson and the program you co-started. It's just fantastic. So Suzanne Galliese, I work for Microsoft here in Canada, and I am actually the channel sales leader um, for Microsoft in Canada. So accountable for all of our partners within the micro, uh, Microsoft ecosystem in Canada. There's about 14,000 partners of which we directly manage about 100, 150, but we watch over and support all of our partners. I have been in the technology services industry for now plus 35 years in a lot of sales roles, mostly sales roles, but back and forth between deep tech and sales. Um, and as uh, most people know, Microsoft as an organization, we are selling across segments from enterprise right through to consumer, multiple cloud technologies. So um, a great spot to be right now when you think about technology and the importance of it um, in the digital transformation of everyone across the planet. So excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mark? Um, thank you. Uh, Mark Bergen. I work with a company called Shopify, uh, which is um, a technology company focused on the commerce space, um, very global in nature, operating over 168 countries around the world. Um, we're about 7,000 employees. And from the sales side of the organization, um, there's about 200 kind of pure sellers, you would say, out in the market space, um, primarily in uh, English speaking countries, although very rapidly moving off into a lot of the international countries. And Shopify is a company is probably best known for supporting e-commerce. Um, we support a lot of the largest, fastest growing uh, brands on the planet um, using our platform to continue to grow. But also um, the DNA of the business is very focused on entrepreneurship. And so we have a very strong mission to make commerce better for everyone. And a huge portion of that is helping um, small businesses, entrepreneurs, people with ideas around the world find ways of creating their business, bring it to life and finding uh, new markets and new channels. Thank you. Karen. Hello, so Karen Pugliese, um, much like Suzanne, I lead our partner organization within the Americas. So um, I've got oversight into Canada, the US and uh, South America for an organization named Comscope. So Comscope is a bit of the best kept secret. We are a network connectivity um, manufacturer. And so we manufacture products that do everything from bringing fiber to the home to uh, building cellular um, solutions so that when you're in a big arena, like the um, Edmonton Oilers stadium, as an example, that you can actually get cell phone signal and uh, on your phone. Um, we are very predominant in hospitals um, from a communications and um, uh, digital enablement perspective as it pertains to the network. We've got um, just about 2,000 um, partners across the Americas. We have a very, I'm going to say, curated approach to, um, to becoming a partner, primarily because 
Um, it does cost the partner uh, money in order to be a certified partner within our within our world. And I manage a team um, that is really focused on kind of our largest and our most engaged partners within the Americas. Um, although we have oversight into all of the partners, very much like Suzanne mentioned, we really have kind of, I'm going to say, touch points with um, with probably about 25 to 30 of those specifically um, with the idea of um, helping them and enabling them to grow their business um, across the Comscope portfolio of products. Comscope's a Fortune 250 organization. We've got 30,000 employees. I think we're in 120 um, different countries. And our main um, approach to market is through the channel. And so um, very much in the enterprise space um, and very much selling through a channel organization um, so we're not actively out there installing or, um, or implementing our solutions. Okay, thank you. Oh, terrific. And Vito, if you could talk a bit about the Hilton. Sure. Hi, Karen, and hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, first of all, I'm a graduate of the, uh, uh, the School of Hospitality and Tourism at Ryerson, graduated in 1994. I think I mentioned this to you, Karen, when I first met you. There was not a sales program at the school at the time, and so I'm absolutely uh, thrilled that uh, you started this, and you've got this up and running, and it's award-winning as well. So it's just it's fantastic to... Uh, to have that for the students because I've always felt that it's a great avenue for students to get into. I got into it right away once I graduated and worked my way through several hotels up to the role that I'm in right now. So I oversee sales for Hilton hotels in Canada, Latin America, and I've got a team in the United States that books business on a global scale as well as I also handle industry relations for the Americas. So working with some key partner organizations, um, mostly in the United States, a little bit in Canada for Hilton. Thank you. So you can see that this is an incredible team of talent. I'm very interested to hear your perspective on some of the questions that we have associated for the conference. Uh, so what we want to get started with is just some foundational questions where we ask a little bit more, if you could talk a little more deeply about the selling function in your, your company and maybe walk us through a typical sales process in your organization. And then if you could speak about what are the key determinants of successful selling in your business? So, so a three-part question. So who, who would like to get started? Do you usually I can gonna, go first. You're going to have to I announce, but first. Suzanne, I think you should go first. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you. Let me go first. <laughs> so, um, uh, I'm trying to remember all three points, Karen. So I'm going to start and then you'll have to nudge me if I miss one. So inside Microsoft, there's, you know, first of all, I would start with Microsoft. 95% um, of our revenue is through our partner channel. So think of it as our partners are selling our software and their services for 95% of what we do in market. So <clears throat> critical to our success. And I think in a recent article, Satya said, we would not exist if not for our partners. So great message there. And it's, it's true, it's being lived every day. There is a direct sales team within our organization. Um, and there's kind of two, I, I would call them two dimensions to it. One are our account team units and they're very much organized by industry. And the other is our specialty team unit, and they are very much organized by the technology for which they go deeper. So, for instance, you may have an Azure infrastructure or an Azure apps or security or teams. Each of, the, each of these units will have depth in those various cloud platforms. And together, they go out into our direct clients along with partners um, to begin the sales process. Um, I would say, you know, our biggest deterrent, Karen, I think I'm missing one because now I'm going to number three, is really around making sure that we're able to articulate the business outcomes that our technology solutions will deliver. And if we're not super clear on that and able to articulate what those outcomes are, what the return on those investments are for our customer, um, you know, 
that in itself is the biggest deterrent to a decision that may not get us to a, to a yes. I mean, ultimately, we're all striving towards a yes, but that to me are the two biggest, um, two biggest things that we need to be looking for, as well as the relationships. Relationships need to be deep and broad across the stakeholders who are going to be involved in deploying that solution and realizing those business outcomes and that return on the investment. So those are the dimensions that we're looking for to be successful in any sale that we're doing alongside our partners. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, let's move to Vito. Can you tell us a little bit about selling at Hilton Hotels and walk us through your sales process and what's most important for successful selling for you? Thank you, Sam. Yeah, thank you, Karen. So um, in terms of what we do, first of all, we call it above property sales. And so we're corporate team members. We, we sort of live above all of the hotels. The hotels themselves have salespeople on property, but they typically work with backyard accounts that they work on just simply because of sort of where they sit and where those accounts kind of sit around them. For many of you who have probably traveled on business, you've probably traveled to a hotel relatively close to the office that you were visiting, and therefore that's how obviously you get to where you are because of those kinds of decisions. We sit above property, so we manage travel programs on a much larger scale nationwide, Americas, and essentially globally. And we do it in two ways. Uh, transient, corporate transient, leisure transient. So corporate transit would be when you travel for your for business. Um, and then group travel. And a lot of it is meetings and events based business. And we manage that on behalf of our accounts that sit, like I said, in the Americas for me, the teams that I manage, we manage their business travel and their meetings and events travel wherever they go around the world. Um, it's uh, now I can only speak. I would like to speak about sort of pre-COVID times for everybody. You all know sort of what's happened to our industry. Um, many of you have probably not traveled in the last year or so, as I've not either. Um, and so let's kind of talk about sort of non-COVID normalized period. Um, it's a it's an absolutely fascinating, fun side of the business. We work with. Buyer. So we're on the B2B side. We're not talking to the consumers. We're not talking to the folks that actually show up at the hotel. We're, we're speaking to the folks that are the travel buyers who, uh, who will issue RFPs for travel programs. And so Shopify, for instance, is a good example of that. Whenever you travel to those 160 countries, you're going to want to work with a hotel company where you trust them and you know that those locations are close to the office that you need to visit. So you'll RFP out your travel needs. We will work with you to identify the best hotels, the best rates, the best locations, and you know, sort of all of that stuff in between. Uh, and we would only work with one person at Shopify, for instance, and, and that person would be your travel buyer responsible for travel. On the meetings and events side, a little bit more decentralized. You'll have you'll have offices all over the world. Microsoft's a good example of that. We work with Microsoft in all three regions of the world where they have offices where they will book meetings and events that are a little bit closer to them. And again, they will source out their requirements, what they need to us as well as our competitors. And then we will obviously sell in the respect of making sure that the buyer understands that our product and our um overall services and what they need are best uh, versus our competition. Uh, and so that's where the, you know, the real sort of selling happens, mano a mano with those, with those folks. So just a, just a distinction, we work with those bigger buyers, a tougher environment because you're talking about multi-country, you're talking about different cultures, you're talking about a lot of different hotels. We, of course, have 6,500 hotels um, and so it's a lot to sort of unpackage for these buyers. So our salespeople have to be really nimble, really smart in how they speak to these buyers, what it is that they're looking, ask all the right questions, make sure we're really unpacking their needs to make sure that we give them what they're looking for. And by the way, we have 18 brands. And so we have to explain those, you know, not only, not only are you needing to understand, do you need to go to Vienna? Do you need to go to Prague? Do you need to go to London? But where do you want to stay? What part of the city? And then what brand fits your needs? What do you require when you're there? Whether it's corporate travel or meetings and events, it's a lot. And, and it makes sales a little bit more complicated, which is why we've got to, we need to have a strong coaching culture. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Mark, as Peter talked a little bit about Shopify, can you tell us a bit about your organization? Yeah, you bet. Um, so I mentioned really quickly, uh, you know, we kind of have this extremely broad mission. I mean, Shopify's mission is to make commerce better for everyone. That is enormous. Commerce has been around probably as long as humans have been around. And as far as we can see, we'll continue. And so at the one end, we have this, you know, entrepreneur, lots and lots of small businesses. And at the high end, we have large, complex, fast growing businesses that already are built on infrastructure. And so, and I say this as a bit of a setup to create some context. So the entrepreneur end of the equation, really we operate like a large business to consumer um, kind of company. So it's a lot of AdWords, it's a lot of content marketing, it's a lot of similar, and people hit the website, consume it, they decide if they wanna uh, launch a store and then there's a really easy way for them to do it. When you get to the larger merchants, and for sake of this, let's say merchants doing you know million or $2 million a year in online sales and, and north of that, suddenly you're in a whole different arena because now it's business to business. I have a platform. I might be doing 700 million a year on a platform which is very busy, lots of architecture and similar. Thinking of replacing that now is exceedingly intimidating. And so now we're into sales and solution engineering and all of the things that go with complex sales. And so uh, that's where we focus most of our sales team's time. So they're focused on the larger merchants. They're focused on um, you know, helping merchants understand kind of what we bring to the table, uh, what their future looks like and similar. Um, the, the environment broadly that we operate in, which is a really, I think one of the reasons um, Shopify has done really well is we're 100% SaaS, um, very much kind of forward linking, uh, looking, sorry, very committed to innovation. And so when we talk about kind of how we sell, um, it's particular when you think of the larger merchants, there's a huge amount of education that goes in. One of the things in my background and my experience is, you know, I worked with a lot of, you know, Fortune 1000s, let's say, and everything's RFP driven. And for those of us who respond to RFPs, they're awful. They're terrible. You know, the, the merchant or the customer decides what they want. They already spec what they think they need to solve it. And they send it out to the market. And the reality is five people can probably all solve it and now run into a price fight. And that's just an awful way to sell. And so I am finding increasingly with the merchants that we deal with, we actually have a massive educational role to play, which is actually helping them foresee where we think the, the environment is going because they don't know. They're experts in whatever they do. We're experts in what we do. And so there's a huge educational component to it. Um, by the time a merchant goes through, uh, you know, the job of rebuilding on Shopify, they don't want to do it again. This is something that they need to buy for, you know, not just next year, but for the next 10 years. And so that's our job. And we spend a lot of time doing that. Um, profile for our salespeople, um, we... Uh, span an enormous range of merchants in size and complexity and maturity levels. So it varies. On one level, uh, we uh, very much are focused on bringing students out of school, teaching them, helping them develop a sales career, um, put a lot of time and energy into helping them, and ideally growing them through the organization. In my experience, they become the best salespeople long term. At the larger end, in a lot of cases, we're bringing in very seasoned, established professional salespeople. They understand the industry. They're very complex sellers. They can do a lot of complicated um, solutioning with merchants, a lot of teaching, a lot of education as they go. So it really ranges in what we're looking for. But I'd say with all of them, what I look for at least is a lot of curiosity, um, a lot of empathy. Uh, clearly, you know, they need to be smart. They need to be systematic in how they go about it. Um, and, and, you know, I think we've all faced this when we're dealing with sellers. They need to be able to face hard truth. Um, you know, you need to understand when you have opportunity and when you don't. And when you don't, you need to move on. Uh, and not get caught up in it. So that's broadly kind of the, the market space we operate in. Thank you so much. Oh, fantastic. Karen. Wow. So, um, so many things to, um, to build on because I think that we experience um, kind of exactly similar scenarios that Suzanne and Mark and, and Vito experience in their, in their sales, uh, in their sales world, world. So because we sell through the channel and, and we're probably very similar to Microsoft in the, in the sense that probably about 95% of our sales go through, um, go through the channel other, at least in the division that, that I'm focused on. Um, you know, we've, education is such a big, um, such a big part of the role that our sellers play. Um, you know, we are very focused on creating demand at the end user. So, um, you know, the majority of, of end users that we're engaged with are like large, you know, large end users. So like a health authority or, um, or a university as an example. And um, so, you know, we're focused on trying to create um, and create knowledge and create um, understanding of the challenges that they're facing and what problems and hurdles they're trying to overcome and build and present solutions that 
that are going to stay with them for you know the next 25 years. So um, no one is you know no one is um, is creating a brand new network at a university campus every five years. So you know when they're going to spend that money, they're going to spend it once and and probably add to it over the course of time. But they're not going to rip it out and start over five years from now. So um, so I think that that's the that's one of the the bigger challenges for our sellers is that. Um, they really do need to understand what their customer is trying to achieve, not just today, but long term. And then how do we build out a solution that is going to meet their long term, um, their long term requirements? You know, when I look at the recruiting of, of salespeople, I think we're very much in the similar situation as Shopify is. We have a lot of very um, young professionals coming in um, into our inside sales organization right out of university um, who kind of start um, start their their career with us in that early entry stage. But then as we move kind of up that enterprise stack to um, some of the larger end users and customers that we have, we have much more, um, I'm going to say seasoned salespeople who've either grown up with the organization or who are professional sellers who've kind of made a career um, and are joining us um, at the at kind of the tail end or later part of their their experience. Um, and I think part of it is because our sales cycle can be anywhere from you know six months to six years. So you know when we look at kind of brand new construction, um, you know that construction cycle takes a really long time, um, especially from a Canadian standpoint. You don't build a new hospital overnight, um, and so you know those are complex sales cycles. Uh, so they take a long time, and so we really do need individuals who understand kind of how to continuously move that forward and balance the fact that, you know, especially today, you can go online and download white papers and briefs and playbooks about, you know, pretty much every solution that any of us are, are talking about today, and that to a certain extent can make a consultant or an end user or um or you know, a channel partner very knowledgeable about a solution at a very high level, but the you know the intricacy of all of it is really in the details, and you really need a person um, or a sales engineer to really get to those details into that intricacy. It's kind of hard to build that into a playbook, which which makes it complicated because um, we do want to stay away from you know that that race to the to the bottom in an RFP scenario every time. Wonderful. Thank you. Really insightful. See an amazing cross section of leaders. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right. So now let's get into some of the situational questions. And I'm wondering what today do you see as the main opportunities and challenges facing your sales organization? And how is that impacting your salespeople and your leaders and your customers? Uh, so whoever wants to speak first. I, I I'll start if you want. Um, I think give her a chance to think. I think on on from an opportunity perspective, this last fourteen months has been crazy town. Like it, you know, we've all experienced it. You know, we're all trying to figure out how to um, sell, run organizations, what this this new normal is going to look like in commerce. Um, you know, coming through March of last year, suddenly there was the like, what's happening? Probably like every organization in the world, what's going on and what's going to happen out of this? And for Shopify. We were already and continue to be beneficiaries of just massive social change. And so we're seeing this rise of direct consumer and brands wanting to cut out middleman. We are seeing, and Shopify is benefiting from this, people kind of, you know, rooting for the underdog. They care about their brands. They don't want to see a world of, you know, one or two giant monoliths that you have to do all your shopping through. It's, and so we support that. We're very much about, you know, the rise of the entrepreneur. Um, you know, we're seeing obviously a lot of digital transformation going. So we've had all these tailwinds that have been driving us forward. And then you throw COVID on top of it. And all of these uh, merchants suddenly having to find new avenues and new ways of selling. And Shopify really became a lifeline in a lot of ways for them. It was very exciting. And internally, our CEO, who normally is always thinking years and years in the future, gave the mandate. He said, that ends right today. For the next immediate foreseeable future, everything is short-term focused on helping our merchants and entrepreneurs actually survive. And so we ship just fast things that they needed in order to pivot really quickly to the new reality that they were in. Um, and so that certainly for us, as we come up the other side of it now and things start to unlock, um, you know, we continue to have a lot of that tailwind behind us. 
we're now at the point we can start, you know, we're thinking long-term again, but really that's for us been massive tailwinds in the business really helped us. It also helps that we frankly are in this like awful legacy environment where most of our competition are big, you know, gross monolith enterprises. Yeah, I said it. Um, and we represent, you know, young, nimble SaaS, you know, lots of innovation driven forward and very focused. This is what we do. We're not trying to do 500 things and commerce is one. We're all about commerce. End of story. I think when you look at the challenges um, facing us is um, as we continue to grow as a business, there's an international dimension to it. And so, as I mentioned, we operate in over 168 countries now around the world. And as we continue to work with larger and larger merchants, there's a lot of complexity to that. We've been very fast growing. We're only 16 years old as a business. And so there's a lot of complexity coming at us. How do we deal with languages, with currencies, with all kinds of buying cultures and similar that we have to adapt to exceedingly quickly as a business? Um, and so I'd say that's one. And then the second is, you know, Shopify's roots is in entrepreneurship. And as we've grown, we've allowed ourselves to continue to get stretched into larger and larger merchants. We haven't pursued. We've just allowed that stretch to happen. Um, and that stretch is happening really quickly right now. And so we're dealing with very complicated, in some case, very mature organizations in some case. And in some, they're ready for Shopify. They're ready for the transformation it's going to mean in their business. We're not coming in as a legacy provider. Um, it's a very different paradigm. And so it requires for the companies that we deal with that their uh, senior leadership and their boards, in a lot of cases, understand this is the transformation we need to make for our business. And we've seen some you know, JB High Fine Australia, it was literally CEO and board saying, this needs to happen in the face of kind of digital transformation. We are going to make that hard right. A lot of companies aren't there. They're thinking about, yeah, it's time to update our platform, but they don't actually understand what that means and how to actually transform their business for the future. And so I'd say from a headwind perspective, um, that's something we continue to face and larger companies will continue to bump into that as we go. Okay, great. So Suzanne, you do a lot about digital transformation at Microsoft. Do you want to share a little bit about your opportunities and challenges right now for your sales organization? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of similarities to what Mark was talking about. You're right, Karen. Karen, when I think about digital transformation, I mean, if we spoke a year and a half ago, I would tell you exactly what Mark just said about those living in the legacy world. Like it was the convincing customers to transform, right? Um, and all of a sudden it switched overnight. And there were a couple of key factors. One, people needed to connect, people needed to be able to run their business very differently. I mean, we've been doing business continuity in DR, we being the technology services industry for decades, decades. But there were the underlying assumptions that made all those plans work changed overnight, right? And it really was, people cannot be together anymore. So businesses had to be rewritten. Um, so, so we shifted from trying to convince customers to move and to change and to, you know, adopt SaaS models and, and begin to really kind of accelerate their innovation to, uh, yeah, I want to do it. I want to do it now. And how fast can you get it done? And it was just, and, and balancing that with, folks who were under this immense pressure, even at home. So you've got this demand going on professionally. You've got this demand happening personally. So the biggest challenge in that moment was truly about rallying around and keeping folks engaged and supporting them through this crazy demand that happened um, from our customers. Not crazy. It's fantastic. Um, you know, certainly Microsoft has benefited from that, which has been incredible. But I think from the inside looking out, seeing us light up all these customers with our technology has been a highlight for me in my career. So it was a pretty special moment as well to see that happen. I think I've been waiting for the cloud shift to happen for about 15 years now, and it just all seemed to happen overnight. So this is a big moment for me <laughs> in my 35 years of tech. Uh, cloud had me at hello. So now it's just navigating through it. And I think when I look inside at Microsoft, um, when I see how quickly they moved and adapted and became agile in the number of um, features and functionality that we were adding to some of our products in highest demand as they were going through that demand curve was just mind-blowing to see that come together. It was super, super impressive. 
I think, you know, it, it, it's really about maintaining the balance um, with your team, making sure you're meeting your customer where they are, being super specific on what to do, when to do it, and how it's going to get done. Um, and I think on, on uh, internally as well, one of the things that we started to do with our partners, but also with our own employees was, you know, almost putting a support structure in place for virtually selling. That was new for a lot of people. You know, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I've been around for 35 years. It was really hard for me <laughs> to switch to virtual um, to the extent to what we're doing it now. So, you know, making sure that we had all the right support structure in place, helping um, our sales teams and our partners to pivot in how they were doing that engagement um, was another big area where we doubled down to make sure we could support and continue to have success in engaging with our customers and getting into e getting to each and every one of them that needed us in this in this moment. And I think as we're coming out of kind of what I would call the crisis, what I'm seeing is equally exciting. It's, you know, I feel like we've ripped the Band-Aid off. It's not, I don't know about the cloud. I don't trust the cloud. I don't, it's, I'm going, I'm going now. I see where I need to be. Um, I think one of the headwinds that we need to all be thinking about, um, and Mark, you mentioned it, you know, when you're looking at the global, we're, we're hearing a lot of talk about um, data sovereignty, right? So when you think about the impact on supply chains that happened over this last 14 months, um, as well as everything else that we experienced, we're starting to really hear uh, data sovereignty come out and, and that voice is getting louder. So thinking about how your solutions and offerings and, and having that dialogue with your customer, putting yourself in their shoes to understand kind of the pressures that they're under, is just becoming increasingly more important. Um, I, I, not that it wasn't already, but it's a big one that I think is coming our way. I've been reading um, Satya's book on kind of the transformation that he took Microsoft through. And it's interesting listening to you talk about it, Suzanne, and you know, Microsoft in the midst of this actually needing to have like high amount of empathy for its customers and helping them through the transformation, almost like, you know, Microsoft's been going through a three-year setup for this. It's incredibly, it's fascinating to kind of hear you say that. It's exciting. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, I joined five years ago. Just, I like to say I started the same year Satya did in CEO role. <laughs> but I've, I've had a front row seat to watch it happen. And it's just been phenomenal to watch it happen. And I couldn't be more pleased to be a part of it. But yeah, it's really cool. Fantastic. So Karen, why don't you, you I, I imagine your industry has had similar and then Vita will talk to you because yours may have been a different experience during this. What's happening at Comscope, Karen? Yeah. So I think the thing that was interesting is that the majority of our sellers were already remote. And so, you know, the whole idea of, of working from your home office really wasn't foreign for, for, um, for our sellers. I think what was very foreign for us, though, was the whole virtual selling piece. Um, because we sell through the channel, you know, we're in front of those channel partners, our channel partners and our distributors on a regular basis, right? And so, you know, a lot of that is face-to-face, -face, a lot of that is meetings, a lot of that is proof of concepts, um, design meetings, you know, standing in a data center, standing in an IT closet, um, you know, standing in the stadium and talking about, you um, and talking about you know black zones where you, you've got no coverage whatsoever and you can't you can't make a 911 call if you, if you needed to and how to you know how to move past those things so i think the struggle wasn't so much the remote working it was the fact that we missed this opportunity to be completely engaged with our partners so i think that was the 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 first kind of struggle for us. I think the second struggle is that you know when we look at our key customers you know our key customers are hospitals, financials, um, you know, the whole higher ed education, um, commercial real estate, all customers that were not spending. And yet we had the complete flip side. And, and Suzanne kind of mentioned this, um, where all of the hyperscalers, anybody who had a data center who was pushing data, anybody who was going cloud, all of our multi-tenant data center customers, you know, we could not we could not light them up fast enough. We could not get them, we could not get product into that space 
fast enough to get them moving at the space that they needed to move given the demand. And so we had like, I'm going to call it the tale of two cities. We had, you know, all of those commercial real estate customers, you know, doing nothing, trying to figure out, you know, how are they going to keep the lights on? Um, and then we had the other extreme where they were going at a speed that, um, that to a certain extent, you know, was was a little bit funny because to Suzanne's point, you know, people have been have been talking about cloud and, you know, about the concept of of moving out of the on-prem data center, right? You no longer have your data center in your head office, in your headquarters. And, you know, not that there wasn't a lot of that happening, there obviously has, but, you know, I'd love to see the chart in terms of adoption over like the last three years and then over the last 18 months. I think it, I think it would tell an interesting story. So, um, so we had both areas of the business that, you know, were very quiet and other areas that were booming. And so as a salesperson, you really kind of had to adapt. You didn't want to abandon those partners who were very strong in an area that was, was quiet. But at the same time, you needed to be able to ramp up in order to support those partners that were now in, um, in a vertical or, or a focus that, you know, working 20 hours a day still wasn't enough to be able to try and get everything done. Um, so I think, I think those are kind of the experiences that we had. And obviously, as a global company, we had different we, we were going through different challenges at different points in time as the pandemic kind of moved its way across the world. So, um, so you know, to a certain extent, I'm, I'm going to say that that was great because then you could pick up the phone and, and, you know, speak to your counterparts in Europe and say, okay, tell me what's going on there. What do we need to get ready for? What, you know, what are some of the things that you were faced with that um, you know, that you weren't well prepared for? How do we get better prepared for it? And so we did have, I don't want to say the luxury of that, but I'm going to say we did have the benefit of that so that when we did go into lockdown from a Canadian perspective, you know, we had already kind of built out a bit of, you know, what I would call a playbook in terms of, okay, this is how we're going to, this is, we're going to reach out to our partners. We're going to ask them, how do we help them? We're going to reach out to all of our you know, hospital or healthcare focused customers and ask them what can we do in order to enable them to be able um, to be at the ready? What do our data center customers need? And so we had a little bit of a playbook that allowed us to be a little bit more proactive in terms of um, kind of being able to share our expertise. And I think that that was probably the benefit of, of being a, a global organization that, that we were maybe at a, at a head just a little bit. Interesting. Thank you. That's great to hear the global perspective. And I love the tale of two cities concept as you talk about that storyline. Vito, you've had a different experience, I think, in HTM. Tell us about what's happened there. And are you prepared for what might be uh, a similar experience as people are allowed to travel again uh, coming forward? Yeah, we're looking forward to that. That's for sure. Um, well, so first of all, uh, our selling style and experiences in the past pre-COVID were very much face-to-face. -face. We traveled everywhere. We got on planes. We walked the halls of our hotels. That's how we sold to our customers, right? We had them physically in the buildings and experiencing the space and the, you know, the food and beverage facilities and all of that kind of stuff. And in the 25 years I've been in the business since I graduated from Ryerson and I've only been in sales and marketing, that's just how we did our business. We brought you to our buildings or we went to your office and kind of showed you some nice photos, but then eventually we wanted you to come to the hotel and experience it. Uh, COVID has obviously changed all of that. We went from a very face-to-face -face type of selling style to a much more tech heavy. Um, and, and I have to say that that's not the solution for us either because we're in the hospitality business. We're, we are people serving people. That's our DNA. That's what we're here for. Um, no robot is going to serve you a meal in a restaurant. No robot is going to take care of setting up an entire wedding for you at a hotel. That's not going to happen. It's always going to be about people serving people. And we have to demonstrate that. We have to, you know, sort of be that. And so where we are today is we're at that inflection point where we're trying to come back and understand, well, where do people want to be face-to-face? -face? Where do they feel comfortable? Where do they uh, want? And I'm not talking about the safety around COVID, just in general, you know, 
do people really want to meet face to face like the way they did before? Some do, some don't. How do they want to do that? Do they want to do it in our hotels or do they just want to do it off site? You know, in a different way of having a sales meeting with a customer. Um, and then we want to integrate technology tools into that to make sure that it's not just a transactional RFP process to Mark's point earlier, because we do that today. It's an awful process. It's just simple punch in, you know, we've got X number of rooms, X number of meeting space in the hotel. We've got great food. Here you go. That's kind of the way it was done before. So the technology is much better today in terms of the tools that we use that our salespeople now have to really maximize both face-to-face -face with technology to make sure that the selling process is really satisfying for that customer. So they get it. They understand it. Look, this is what it, this is how I feel when I'm at your hotel. I know I'm going to have a great experience at the hotel and I'm going to book it in the way I want to book it. I want to, I want to do all of that sort of functional stuff in a way that makes it easy for me to do that when I've made that decision. Whether it's a global travel program or whether it's just a meeting for 10 people in a boardroom somewhere. So we're trying to find that balance right now. We're talking about it as we speak to our salespeople and saying, yes, you should do this, but you should also apply that. And I'm not, you know, we don't have the solution yet, to be honest with you. We're, we're obviously still figuring all of that out. But we've never been there before because, like I said to you, it was because we were people serving people, we were always on the road and we were sort of always chasing buyers around. And uh, we're obviously in a different time today. Are, are you preparing for um, the, the post-vaccine travel surge that's been anticipated at the moment? Uh, well, look, if I lived in the United States, uh, yeah, we would be a lot further in that. Uh, I, I report into the U.S. offices, our head offices, of course, is in Washington, D.C. Um, it's a fascinating to hear what's going on down there. I mean, people are moving. It's, it's, it's all about being mobile. In fact, our first industry event with a full trade show and all of that is happening in three weeks in Las Vegas. And, and a ton of our folks are going. A ton of our customers are going face to face. There will be 2,000 people. Uh, in Vegas for that. And we will only be one conference of, I'm sure, many in Vegas in a month's time from now. So the industry is moving faster, obviously, in the United States than it is in Canada and Latin America. Um, but I do think that there's a there's obviously, we've all know this, there's just a, a ton of pent up demand for meetings, business meetings, for events to happen. Um, never mind leisure travel. I think we're all ready to go on a trip somewhere nice. Um, but, but in terms of the actual business side of it, yeah, I think there's a lot of pent up demand for people to get out there. So once those restrictions start to lift off and people feel comfortable and safe to kind of do that, that's when we will say, yes, let's do this. Let's meet in person. Let's have that event and let's integrate our technology tools within that to make sure, like I said earlier, that our salespeople are really doing two things at once. And it's not transactional and it's not the old like, hey, let's have a lunch together and, you know, sort of hammer out uh, a deal. It's not either of those. It's somewhere in between. It's happening in the United States right now as we speak. I'm watching it happen. Um, hopefully in Canada over the next few months, like I said, as things start to kind of move along, we'll start to see that happening here as well for us. Okay, terrific. So you've all talked a little bit, well, I didn't specifically ask about COVID. We've all, as we talked about challenges, discussed that and how you adapted to the COVID pandemic. What do you think, in terms of many of you talked about virtual selling and, and the different approaches that you're using in sales, what do you think is going to stick afterwards? Do you think once we're able to be in person, like you're seeing in the States, it's all going to be face-to-face -face again? Or do you think buyers are interested in continuing some type of virtual communication? Please. I think looking at what's happened in the last year, I, I, I'll speak for myself, you know, prior to this, lots of nights away from home, lots of international travel. Um, I've got two um, kids in public school, one high school, one um, uh, elementary. Um, I've enjoyed not being on the road. And, and don't get me wrong, there's lots of stuff that has not been fun. But I've actually found a whole new normal and a new routine, which is much more healthy and actually, you know, started an institute a whole bunch of new stuff that I actually really like in my life. And so personally, I have very little desire to get back to where I was. Now, doesn't mean I don't want to travel. Absolutely. To Vito's point, like I am totally ready to travel, ready to see people, ready to get back and visit the teams. Um, but it's changed. I, and I think a lot of our buyers feel the same. And so I suspect 
we'll absolutely see travel come back, but I think we've seen a structural shift in the market space. Uh, and I'm going to make the bet that um, I think probably our travel's cut by half um, from a business perspective moving forward. Those days of like, hey, hop on a plane and boot down to New York and let's just meet for a couple hours. I think they're done. I think we've all learned that, hey, we don't actually need to do that. But um, I think there will absolutely be lots of travel, but it would be intentional and thoughtful and used really well. I agree with that. 100%. I 100% agree. Yeah, I agree as well. Yeah, me too. I think there's one variable, though, that I keep thinking about is now it's a norm, right? Um, and everybody's in the same boat. Once folks start to go back, what does that begin to look like? And does that begin to change um, expectations? I don't know. I don't know. But I, I'm with all of you. and I'm with you, Mark. I like not being on the road all the time. Um, it, it's made a huge difference. Massive. I didn't even realize. Um, but um, I, 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 I wanted to chime in, Suzanne, you make a good point. And I just I heard this and it was a U.S. Uh, statement where and this was specifically about sales, where somebody had said in a broadcast, and again, U.S. based, they said, the moment that somebody's competitor finds out that they've been to see their customer and they weren't there, they will go there. And yeah. so I think that it's going to, I, I agree with you, Mark. I think absolutely people are going to think twice before they do that day trip to New York. And I've done many of those, Montreal, I mean, all that stuff. But boy, the moment that I hear my competitor has gone to see a big customer and I wasn't there, you know, if you're a salesperson and you own that account, you're going to be racing to your manager's door and saying, mm -hmm. hey, I got to go too." you know, like, so, so I think that's where this balance is really going to be hard to manage, you know, especially like in my role, I oversee, you know, 35 sellers in multiple countries and they're always throwing stuff at me, you know, I want to do this and I want to do that and should we do this or you know, how do we hold that back as sales managers, knowing that the salespeople are under the gun to make their numbers? And, you know, as we sort of come out of this thing, boy, that is going to be really hard, really hard. Yeah, I think one of the things that is actually going to change, I, I, this is this is just my perception. I don't really have a don't have a research analyst to refer back to. But, um, you know, I, I I do think Mark's got a point that I think travel will be. I think for the for the actual sales for the actual seller, um, I agree, Vita, that they're going to get on the plane and they're going to go see they're going to go see that customer. I think where the intentional aspect is going to come is more about sales leadership, right? When I when I kind of look back, you know, I would I would do these cross country tours, right, where I would want to go out and see my sellers and my sales leaders in 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 the various markets and spend time with them. I think even though my role is different now, I, I still don't see myself doing as much of that now having been able to recognize that, you know, I can coach, I can mentor just as almost as effectively virtually as I can kind of being face to face with them. I think the most interesting pivot that I'm that I'm looking forward to seeing is kind of what that future of workplace looks like, because I, I don't know that people are going to be now. It, the U.S. has disproven this statement already, but, you know, we used to kind of put everybody into all these little cubicles right beside each other. Um, I don't know that people are going to feel as comfortable with that anymore. And I don't know that people are going to rush back to being 100% in the office. I think we're, we're going to, my sense is that we're going to end up with this hybrid structure where people are, might go in you might have people who have to be in the office every day, but you're going to end up with this whole swath of people who are just going to go in when it makes sense for them to go in. Um, and I think that's going to be the real interesting outcome in terms of how does that look at the yeah. end of the day? What is that? What does that culture then feel like or become or how did how does it get created? I, I think that'll be um That'll be really interesting. I think that's a huge question. Um, uh, you know, you're, I don't know, maybe you're not aware. Um, Shopify has been very clear. This is the new normal. Yes. We are not going yeah. back to offices. And our CEO has been very clear on it. We're changing our talent profile as a result. We're changing the way we think about it. You no longer need to move to Toronto, Ontario, or Ottawa, or Waterloo in order to work for Shopify. It's drastically changed the talent pool we can go after. Now, it also has with it a whole bunch of other questions. And we're taking the bet 
that people have now, a large swath of people have decided, I'm no longer going to move my life to fit my job. I'm now going to make my job fit my life. And so we've seen lots of our employees say, I don't want to live in downtown, insert city. I want to live in the country. I want to live by a lake, or I've always wanted to live in a different province or country or what have you. And now we can support them to choose where they want to live and work around that. And it's going to be an interesting. I, I think you're right, Karen. And one of the things I wonder for companies that are looking at kind of this hybrid, um, I think much to Vito's point, you start creating a little bit of an arms race again. Well, that, you know, my colleague is in the office spending time with, you know, one of the leaders who chooses to be in the office and I'm not. Now, am I falling behind? Am I not being seen and similar? And that was part of, I think, the underpinning with us was to say, no, we will create a level playing field. This is it. And so I think it's going to be very interesting in the next few years to see what happens. And you, you may be right, um, you know, Vito on your bet there. It may be a race back to, you know, this is uh, the, the way it always used to be. And it's up for us as sales leaders to help our salespeople define what that really means and what they, you know, when they really need to travel and how they use their time well. And I agree with Karen. I think there is, there'll be a fundamental difference between the sellers and the leadership. And maybe the, maybe the leaders might hold up a little bit longer. You know, it might be a few more years before you get back on that, unfortunately, that sort of wheel where you're sort of always out every week kind of a thing. But certainly I think the sellers, they've got, you know, they've got goals to attain and they, they I've often heard this over the years. I'm sure everybody has sellers are going to sell. They want to be out there. They want to engage and they want to, they want to make their numbers. And so, this will, uh, you know, I think we have to ensure that they don't go nuts here. You know, like, let's manage this. Let's, you know, can can a Teams meeting, Suzanne, can a Microsoft Teams meeting take care of this discussion, this meeting better than than, than hopping on a plane and going out there for, you know, for just one meeting? I, hopefully those will, will, will um, those discussions will happen more and more, but certainly from a leadership perspective, you know, right now for me to get on a plane for one meeting, no, that's not, that's not in the cards. I'm hoping it's changed. I think internally running each of our businesses, I think it's hybrid um, for all the reasons, you know, Mark, we don't care what you've said. I don't think that will change, um, but I think it'll be interesting to see. I think the the external facing sellers, it will be driven by the customer. And I think for me, that's the big variable that I'm not sure what's going to happen once folks start to go back to work. It's really very interesting. I've loved hearing your perspective. And I, I also think competition is going to do this, but buyers may also change the nature of this and how they prefer to work. So that'll be interesting to see. Thank you so much for sharing those incredible insights. So now let's talk a little bit about our great country of Canada. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about what you think makes selling in Canada different from the rest of the world. Uh, what do we excel at as Canadians? And where are some areas of improvement? Vito, do you want to start? Because you have that global perspective at the moment. Yeah, a, a couple of things. Number one, um, I've hired many sales folks over the years in Canada. They're all well-educated. Um, you know, a lot of folks come from hospitality schools like Ryerson, Guelph, um, some of the colleges. And so a lot of, a lot of folks that I've interviewed and, and have wanted to get into sales really come from you know, very focused education in the business. And so it's a lot of fun to bring them up and bring them into the into the business. We're very lucky, by the way, uh, in Canada, well, in any of our hotels, I should say, um, a lot of folks start off in the hotels themselves, and then they move up to more corporate regional roles. So the hotels are really a great place to recruit some of our, our folks. But Canada is a great country for, uh, for salespeople in general, for, for a few reasons. Number one, um, the U.S. can be a little bit too fast-paced at times to really kind of get to know your customers and really kind of build those relationships. You know, if you've ever tried to sell in New York City, I have. Uh, these meetings happen very, very fast, and there's not a lot of sort of warm and fuzzies. Um, I have been on many sales calls in Latin America where a three, four-hour lunch slash dinner uh, can go on for, you know, quite a while and only to kind of wrap things up in the last five minutes. Uh, which can be frustrating, and you need to really be patient when you're down in, in you know, in Latin America and many of those countries. So Canada is kind of the best of both worlds. You know, we don't we don't sort of rush people out the door, but we don't sort of take our time. I, I feel like it's just a great environment. Well-educated sellers, great customers, 
to really give our folks the time that that they really need to, you know, obviously talk about our product, get to know each other, build good relationships. Um, I, I've always found that, you know, I'm very lucky because I've worked in, in all, all, all parts of the Americas that every time I come home, I always find that those sales calls, those experiences are, are just, um, I wouldn't say they're easier because customers are always tough, of course, um, but, but they, they just feel better. They're just, you know, it's the right amount of time, right amount of resources and energy to really get the job done. Great. Karen, what's your perspective on that? Thanks, Vito. So I was gonna. So I was gonna just build off of Vita's um, comment. So you know the the experience that I've had, where I've had U.S. sellers kind of come and sell into Canada, um, is just about the level of niceness. And I know that that's a little bit of a stereotype, but even a bad meeting tends to still be nice, right? Even though you know you could be having a conversation about about something not good, it's still it's still a very nice professional meeting and it and you know I've been in some meetings in in other countries when things are going badly and they really aren't very nice right there's really you know there's there's kind of that element of of um of it not being as 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 nice um or or maybe professional um you know I think the I think the other thing when I look at and and you know I'll use kind of like my entire sales history um, versus just from a Comscope perspective, I've always had a very um, well-educated, very diverse team um, from a Canadian standpoint. Whether you know, and when I when I talk about diversity, I mean new Canadians, you know, Canadians that um, are from all over, you know, different parts of Canada that have, you know. Um, that have different backgrounds, different roots, you know, whether they're, they're new Canadians or immigrants or whatever. And I think that um, way more, um, way more diversity within my, my Canadian organization versus, um, versus my U.S. organization. Um, and, and certainly I think the other, the other pieces, I'm going to say much more of a global mindset in terms of how they how they understand and see the market, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that, you know, if you're in an industry and tech's a great example, you know, so much of of the um, so much of of it comes out of Silicon Valley. So much of it comes out of the U.S. is that you need to understand the U.S. market, but you also need to understand the Asia Pacific market. You need to understand. Um, what the dollar is doing, you need to understand the currency exchange, and I think that 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 breeds a little bit more of a financial um, and global mindset that maybe you wouldn't see in other parts other parts of the world. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think um, <clears throat> with a cup with, with all of it, but I would say the diversity of Canada. And the, the people that you're engaging with, whether you're working with them or selling to them, um, is probably like nothing I have seen um, in my travels over my career. Um, it's also very relationship-based in Canada. And I, I learned a very valuable lesson when I left. Well, I didn't leave. I actually stayed here and I had an America's role for a few years and with a prior employer. And the, the biggest allocation of my team was in the U.S. And when I came back to Canada, I felt like I'd moved out of Canada and I'd been completely forgotten. And I had to rebuild all of those relationships that I had for the many years before. So it is very tight commit, tight community, relationship built. The diversity, I think, you know, speaks volumes to um, the level of knowledge, learning experiences that we have when we're engaging with our customers across, and it, it, it's, it's cool. It's very, um, um, I'm always learning something, which is fantastic. I think the other, there's two other dimensions to our country that I think folks should know about as well. You know, one is language. It's almost like there's two different sides of our country, right? And it's English and it's French. And we have to be very respectful and operating in a, in a, in a French um, language, culture. Um, and then the other dimension in Canada is regional, right? So you've got East, 
Central, and West. And very different cultures inside each of those regions of Canada. So it's, you know, the, and, and each of them like to work very closely and make sure that they are supporting the economy around them. Um, and then the other one I would say, Karen, you know, what, what, what keeps me up at night about <laughs> Canada is I think we are the biggest exporter of innovation and talent. And I want to put a stop to that one day. Like, I really think this is our opportunity to do, you know, like what a, what a Shopify has done, but on a scale like we never thought imaginable. And, you know, um, for me, that's why cloud had me at hello, just putting that technology into everyone's hands. And when I see the talent out there in our partner ecosystem, because I have both services and ISVs, I am blown away every day by what's going on in Canada. And we just really need to be adopting, supporting and accelerating the growth of these incredible com companies around the world. Like, it's just phenomenal. Uh, and the faster we do that, I want to be known for innovation in the globe um, here in Canada. So well spoken. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> yeah, I'm motivated hearing you talk about that. <laughs> Mark, Mark, what are your thoughts about Canada? In yeah, number, number one, amen, Suzanne. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. We, we have this, there's a, a identity crisis in Canada, especially for those of us in tech where, you know, for a lot of young people, it's this badge of honor to go down and work in Silicon Valley. And for those of us who spent time in Silicon Valley, it's actually nothing that great. <laughs> and in fact, we've actually seen over the last five or six years, this talent flood coming back to Canada. I interview people who've been out in Silicon Valley, like I'm done building American companies. I want to build Canadian companies again. I want to build our country. I want to build their home. And I think we don't do a good enough job instilling that in our students. They don't, feel that sense of like, yeah, we, you know, we actually have tons to offer an amazing ecosystem of companies in Canada. So, I mean, t I, I agree with everything said, tons said, I'll try to avoid repeating. Um, uh, the word I would use, I think is um, uh, Canada in a lot of ways, I find extremely similar to the US, but with a lot more empathy. I think in the US it's, you know, do I win, do you win, and do I beat my competitor? Then we probably have the basis for a deal. Canada is a little higher on the EQ side, I think. And so there's a little more empathy that goes into a little more trying to understand you, what you're trying to do long-term, you know, how it fits in the ecosystem. And so I think the two things or three things I think I would add on top. One is um, to pick up a little bit on what Suzanne said about kind of size of country, um, reputation matters a lot. And where, you know, in some bigger countries, you can screw up in a couple places and it's fine. The country's so big, you just move on to your next one. You can't do that in Canada in the same way. It is a smaller country. It's highly networked within your industry, generally speaking. You're probably two or three degrees of, you know, from of separation between most other people in your industry. And so reputation matters a lot. And when you develop a strong and a good reputation, it carries you a long way. Um, so it's said to be number one. Um, number two, uh, which was mentioned is we are very much an export nation. Um, I've done some selling globally. I remember meeting um, some companies in the Netherlands and the mindset was very much we're a small country. Everything is export driven. So they're always thinking about how they export, where are they selling to? And I think in Canada, for a lot of companies, it's the same. We sit on top of what has been at least, you know, one of the largest economies in the world. Um, and so a lot of mind share and a lot of time goes into how do I access other countries? How do I access the US? How do I access Asia Pacific? It was mentioned. How do I access into the European market? And so I think that's very important. Yes, there absolutely is, you know, inter um, country trade for sure, but a lot of companies, certainly the majority of companies I've worked with through my career actually thinking about, you know, how do I move outside our borders? How do I move into other countries? I think that's really important. Um, and I'd say the one thing uh, I do find is I think at times, um, and I don't, I won't try to take a stab at the root of this one, but I think at times Canadians can be a little risk averse. And I see opportunities come along where, from my perspective, and now listen, often not my money, uh, not my decision, uh, but I'm surprised sometimes at how slow sometimes what seem to me really good, obvious decisions to be. And I think that reputation can kind of fit a little bit. Um, and I think, you know, whereas, you know, particularly in Silicon Valley in the US where like, we'll make a bet on anything and there's always money. And if you fail, don't worry about it. There's like another VC ready to back your next idea. We don't have that same culture in Canada. And so there is a bit of risk aversion I find in the Canadian market. And so I do find at times sales can be a little slower. They take a little, you know, a little longer to get through a little more due diligence. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that per se, but I think it's something for people working in the Canadian market. There's often this perception of it's just America, but maple syrup and A. 
um, which is true in a lot of ways, but I do think there is a little bit of risk aversion, a little higher EQ, a little higher empathy. Thank you so much for sharing that knowledge. I, I, from a university perspective, I've seen some many amazing sales education programs in America and other places of the world. And that is something that I think we 100% need to work on improving in our country. Uh, and, and that might help with getting them younger, more risk, uh, more, more prone to taking more risky opportunities and, and training them. And to that regard, I, I'm so grateful for you sharing your insights and knowledge so we can help educate our young people here in Canada and, and, and use those incredible skills that we have in this nation for selling. Are there any other things you want the world to know about Canada uh, other than us being so wonderfully empathetic, diverse, and, and great sellers, great sellers in this country? Uh, any last minute things you want to share before we close? We have super smart young people, but they're ours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just to make sure we hold on to those young people who are watching this is we, we actually, uh, KPMG recently did a survey of CEOs around the world. Uh, and the topic was innovation and digital transformation. And I think it was high end of 80% of CEOs said they're moving faster. Canada, we are truly at a tipping point, was in the 90s. We were right at the top. And I thought, like, this is our moment. It's happening now. And we need to hold on to all our young people <laughs> and just rule the roost from Canada. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. And I think that there's this great opportunity for you know, and, and so I'm going to kind of take my Comsco hat off, but I think there's a great opportunity for like homegrown Canadian businesses to be out on the campus, to be engaged with, um, with universities, to talk about kind of some of what I would call the, you know, the diamonds in the rough um, of organizations that exist within the Canadian market. I think that um, and nothing against, you know, I work for Fortune 250 company and, and, you know, like Suzanne, right, big global company, same thing with Mark, same thing with Vito. Um, not that there's anything wrong working for a global company, but I, I really think that the global companies have the tendency to get a lot of the attention and focus, either through brand recognition or just, you know, availability of spend or availability of resources on a university campus when it comes to those career days. Um, that, you know, I think whatever, whatever we can do to really highlight kind of Canadian born, Canadian innovators, Canadian organizations at those university campuses, because sometimes the brand recognition isn't there. Um, and I think they should have the opportunity for like the best and the brightest, right? The, the opportunity to kind of keep that within the, within the country and, and really leverage the expertise that that's been, that's been built up. So that's my, it's my non-corporate statement as it pertains to, um, as it pertains to, to continuing to, uh, to support the Canadian um, innovators and, and entrepreneurs. I love that idea. <laughs> and I feel the same way around diversity and, and inclusion, right? If you're, if you're a big company in diversity, and inclusion is important for you, then, then on your RFP response, that should be a category to say, how diverse is, is this organization that I'm looking at purchasing my products and services from? And, and if they're not diverse, that should be more important than, you know, some of the other criteria, but that's, that's a whole other soapbox that I won't, uh, <laughs> that, I, that I won't step on. <laughs> hey, Vito, do you have any last parting words before we go? Um, no, I was going to say um, back in the 70s, 80s and 90s, it was kind of um, to what Mark had said, um, it was kind of this thing where hotel graduates would go away, you know, and work in Europe and some fancy resort somewhere. Um, and, and some stayed, but most did come back because the quality of life just wasn't there for them. Uh, quality of life uh, here in Canada is much better for folks who work in our business. Um, and then you couple that with a uh, little bit, uh, certainly the diversity, a uh, little bit more of the technology advancements, just like in terms of these organizations that are here. It's just a fun, 
great place to live and work all at the same time. So I think you're starting to see that, sort of, you know, in our business where everybody kind of left. Now folks are simply just staying They are. I've spoken to a few folks uh, who work in our hotels and sales who have said, listen, I've got a great life. You know, I live in Toronto or I live in Montreal, I live in Vancouver, great city, of course. And I work in a beautiful hotel and I get to visit customers and I get to, you know, and I, I, I have a great income because I'm in sales and because of all of the incentives around sales, which is a key benefit to folks who work in that side of the business that a lot of folks are figuring out very quickly. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to live. And this is where I want to work. And uh, I think in Canada, we've got all of that going for us. And that's why those graduates, Karen, from programs like yours are going to be obviously the future of sales in our business. And, and we're looking forward to it. They're very, they're very sharp and they know what they want. And uh, a lot of it is right in front of them. Wonderful. Well, thank you. A huge thank you to all of you amazing leaders for sharing your great insights and knowledge. I'll certainly come back to you as the conference it's wrapped up and we, we uh, come together with new ideas coming out of this and, and share with you the findings. I do appreciate your time. Thank you so much, everybody. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Karen. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye.